know, did you know, did you know, did you know, did you know that guys were kids? Welcome, family. I know y'all missed us. Um, we took a little hiatus to, to put together some great content for y'all for the next upcoming months. So be looking out. We're looking forward to a great program moving forward. And we wanted to commemorate the end of Black History Month um, by highlight, highlighting some of the iconic leaders and moments in Black history. The knowledge is power. And there's a lot of things that we just don't know. We don't necessarily have the tools and information that we need to love ourselves accordingly. Uh, so we just want to share some of that with y'all. Um, I'll take a moment to introduce our panelists, starting with D Moss. Hey, what's happening, everybody? My name is D Moss, um, publisher of the Metro Record. I'm here and ready for it. Is that Rob? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robert Jones, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> that was quick. He's usually uh, got much more to say than. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sa I'm saving it. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I don't know about y'all, but you know I love to to study my people. Um, I've been obsessed with you know just understanding who we are and where we come from. And a lot of times, it's so much easier to point out you know, the wrong way that we do things and the wrong way that we think, but we are the innovators of civilization. Um, and a lot of us don't know that because that, that legacy has been stolen from us. And not only has it been stolen, but, you know, people take credit for, for the thing that we do. So I just want to highlight, you know, how far we've come, um, the, the great things we've done in, in history. Um, so anybody would like to share? Go ahead. Yeah. Can I add to that? Um, to, to amplify yes. what many were saying, not only was it stolen and other people taking credit, there's that the miseducation piece, right? So education, our education is not being taught in the schools. Um, it's being overlooked. And when it is being taught, oftentimes it's being taught incorrectly. And we see countless examples of how things get mitigated or relegated to the back. Black inventions, black contributions, um, black uh, ingenuity, all that stuff kind of, you know, gets glossed over if even discussed at all. And these are educators who are supposed to who have kind of a fiduciary responsibility. If you're going to teach history, et cetera, that you should teach it accurately. But that's part of the system of uh, systemic white supremacy is to continue to miseducate. So. You know, we're going to get into some things today to highlight some of the iconic leaders in Black history and also movements and inventions, et cetera. Yeah, I think it's a necessary conversation. I think as we talk about classical African history, we're talking about the birth of the world. We're talking about the birth of modern civilization uh, from sanitation systems to writing, painting, numbers documenting things on, you know, journals as we look at the papyrus. Um, we're looking at the building of the seven wonders of the world to an extent. And I know there are a lot of folks who want to debate that. Um, if you take away African history completely out of the world picture historically, you have to ask yourself what exactly is left. So I think these types of conversations are absolutely necessary. We need to constantly, especially being um, <laughs> Africans in America, we have to remind ourselves from whence we came. And someone, ha I had a conversation about a week or two ago and I told Rob about it earlier. I was like, you know, why is it okay for African-Americans to co-opt and take what they want from African history, but get upset when Africans come here and borrow from African-American history? The bottom line is we split it off. You were never here. We've been here through the trials, the tribulations, the building up, the burning down. We've been here, but we started there. So whether people like it or not, if I look at my Ancestry.com DNA breakdown, break, break I'm looking at Benin, Ghana, and primarily Nigeria. So when I look at the peoples of those particular geographic region, whether you like me or not, love me or hate me, that's my birthright as well. So I feel like I, I feel as if I have the right to speak on it if I so choose. So. 
That was uh, real profound, B Moss. I didn't know you made such a distinction between Africans in America and, and Africans on the continent. I would I would love to build on that um one day, but would anybody like to share any iconic lead their favorite leader before I go ahead any iconic moment I want to start with? Or should I go first? No, nah, you can go first. Okay, good. <laughs> ladies, ladies first, of course. It's your show. Um <laughs> When I think of iconic moments in, in, in black history, and not just, you know, African-American history, because, you know, we get caught up in, in what we're taught, and, and a lot of people don't go, you know, beyond us reaching this land and, and the contribution we made here, because before that, we, we, were, we were cultivating the world. Um, and when I think about iconic leaders and iconic moments, I think about Queen and Zynga. Um, and... So she was what is um, in modern day Angola, um, which it actually was a title. It was uh, the title for king was Angola. You know how white folks, they come and they, they misunderstand and they put it, so they call the whole land Angola, when really right. was the title of, uh, of the king. Um, but so here come the Portuguese, right? Um, slavery is booming or whatever. And you hear a lot about how, you know, black tribes sold their brothers and sisters into slavery. Um, and that's used as an excuse to, to our predicament now. But um, you can imagine how they came in strong arming people. You know what I mean? So in Angola, here come the Portuguese or whatever, and they want slaves. A lot of history books will tell you that, but they, they're negotiating like slaves. We want slaves. Give us your slaves. Angola wasn't having it at the time. So there was... Um, the king at the time sent his sister to negotiate with the with the Portuguese, and um, when when Queen Nzinga came in, they didn't have a they didn't have a chair for her. There was nowhere for her to sit. They had a mat on the floor, and and, and so their, when you have a mat on the floor and and that's offered as a seat, it, it's a sign of inferiority, and they knew that. So she came in to negotiate, and she realized they didn't have a seat for her. So what? servants got down on all fours so Nzinga can sit on her back while she negotiated with um, the Portuguese uh, leaders at the time. <clears throat> and to me, it's not necessarily Nzinga who shined in that moment, but it's the, it's the servant who got on her knees and helped her make a seat at the table. And that to me is, is amazing because there's so many unsung heroes in history, people whose names you don't know, who you'll never hear about. And that woman willingly got down on all fours in, in, in subservience to, to the queen while she negotiated. And you got to understand positioning too. If, if someone is upstanding you, like you're standing up and you're sitting, um, that, is, that is a sign of inferiority. She wasn't having it. Um, but she was amicable in her negotiation. She got baptized. She changed her name. And it wasn't enough for them. So her brother who was the king at the time died. Now some people say that she killed him. I'm not mad at her if she did. Um that, <laughs> that's just speculation. <laughs> yeah. That's so, what they did back then. Yeah, I mean the <clears throat> you know the safety and the longevity of the people, I don't see what they're in to negotiate. You know what I'm saying? But other chiefs in in, in you know I might have tried to do what was best and, and, and avoid bloodshed. Maybe they wasn't you know, as, as strong militarily to, to combat um, the Portuguese or the French or whoever was trying to kill their people. But um, Zingo was military trained, and when she went to be queen regent because her son was too small, they didn't like that because, of course, it's the patriarch, you know what I'm saying? It's a man's world, so they didn't like that. But she had the respect of the military because she was trained. There was nothing they could do about it. And she fought him off. She fought him, she fought him, she fought him. Um, and either they attribute, there's a statue of her in the Angola now, but they attribute her and her leadership to how even hundreds of years later they became a free, a free country. So I think, I just think that is, that is so dope on so many levels as far as where we are now. You know what I mean? Like if they don't want to give you a seat, you make one. You know, we support each other, we hold each other up, and that's the only way to fight them off. So to me, that's like one of, she's an icon leader in, in black history and that was an iconic moment for me and again I want to point out that 
the woman who got on all fours so that uh, Queen Azinga could sit on her back like she was, you know, an unsung, untold hero in, in that moment. So that's what I think about when I think about, you know, iconic leaders and iconic moments in, in Black history. You know, um, that, that's great. And, and I remember hearing stories about her and how fierce and ferocious a fighter she was, but also the tactician she was, right? Because you just can't go in every battle just waving swords, stone spears, bows and arrows, whatever. You have to really be a tactician and set up a plan and the strategy of attack. And I, I think that's one of the things that they don't talk about with her. They just talk about, you know, her taking power, her, her fighting the Portuguese, but they don't talk about how brilliant of a tactician and strategist uh, strategist she was. So that, that's great to point she's out. She's 82 years old too. So she, she died an old lady, you know, comfortable in her bed after fighting them off. And another part of that story that I think, um, you know, deserves some, some illumination is the fact that she called in the Dutch. That's how um, she partnered with the Dutch. Yeah, the Dutch came to her aid and, and fighting off the Portuguese. So when we think about, you know, our relations with, with, with our alabaster peers, what I like to call them, um, I understand that those strategic alliances mean everything. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to be able to liberate ourselves by ourselves. So we got to find those allies that are really in support of our cause and, and leverage those relationships so that we could, that we could be free. Yeah, the allies definitely need to be vetted out. But that alliance you made with the Dutch to fight the Portuguese off, again, for our audience, when you make an alliance, you have to come from a position of strength. So the fact that, you know, she was coming from a position of strength that the Dutch saw as mutually beneficial for them and, um, and that she saw for her people is something that you just can't overlook. And even the Dutch were, you know, fierce slave traders and stuff like that back in the day too. But at the end of the day, everybody was um, positioning for power in Europe. And also the fact that you mentioned, Minnie, that she died at 82. Back then, that was probably double the life expectancy of people living during that time. That's a, that, that is a fact. And like you said, how the Dutch, you know, they, they had their own slave trade going on. But at the same time, it's hard to say, you know, what somebody's interior motives are, but just keep it in mind, like, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You know what I'm saying? I'm that too. The fact that these people be beefing with each other, too. You know what I mean? So if you can come from a position of power and get a, um, and uh, Selassie, I tried to do that, too. Um, and that was his, that was to his demise, actually, when he went to, um, to, to try right. For aid from the French in the Haitian Revolution, his partner basically said, "Don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go." And that was that was really um, a, a pivotal a pivotal moment in, in, in that movement, and it, it really stifled stifled that movement. So it's not going to work all the time. You got to be strategic in how you do stuff. He went to them. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe if they had it been in Haiti, you know what I mean? Things would have yeah. been. But he went to them to ask them for aid, not understanding you know, who his enemy was, really. Um, so it's not going to work all the time, but definitely got to vet these uh, these um, strategic alliances. But it's what you got. You have to do it. You have to do it. No, you got to have resources. The United States fights proxy wars all the time where they're like, listen, we can't support you publicly. We can give you weapons. We can train your soldiers. We, we don't want to be in the public eye as far as being a part of these wars. They probably started, but, you know, those those, those alliances mean everything. When we think about it, you know, anybody that the government, that the United States has given aid to, like, you know, especially like in the Middle East, they took that training and they took those those, those resources and they fought even to this day for their own liberation. It's not like they stopped there. It's not like they said, oh, we got some we got some aid from the United States, now we're going to be friends forever. Like, nah, now that we trained, now we're, we're a for, more formidable opponent. So. Yep, and the U.S. ends up having to go back to fight them for, like you said, their proxy wars. You know, you know, along with um, the question you wrote, you raised about like iconic leaders. When I was coming up, of course, I didn't teach anything about Black history, but Budweiser was doing uh, the Great Kings and Queens of Africa. Um, they were doing an advertising on that, and I had all the posters. 
And at first, you know, I just had the posters hung up, but I was just looking at the images and my eyes settled in more often than not on Shaka Zulu. But I ended up reading about Hannibal of Carthage because he was up on an elephant. And I actually have a, a T-shirt with that image on it. He's sitting at, atop an elephant and um, he's got a dagger in his hand. And I was like, who is this dude sitting atop of this elephant? And I, I was probably in maybe third or fourth grade. And I was just fixated on that guy. And I was like, look, at that age, looking for anything I can find to read up on that guy um, outside of the, the paragraph or so, you know, highlighting Hannibal. But the fact that he was a general in Carthage in Northern Africa, and he invaded Italy, Rome, the Roman Empire, but he invaded from the Alps. So he wasn't going to go at the boot of Italy where all their forces were kind of marshaled and, and gathered. He went around, started from the Alps, went over the Alps um, on those elephants with those elephants and attacked from the north down. So at some point he conquered about three quarters of Italy. And back in those days, and, and if you watch um, some of those old ancient uh, war movies, you know, when you when you beat somebody, you automatically assume their army. You take their specter or whatever. So as he's going down Italy and he's beating these armies, you know, he's infusing their warriors and with his warriors. So that's how his army kept growing. Um, but at the, ultimately, he ended up getting defeated. But I mean... He was for years. He was over there fighting, and at first, these people never seen elephants before, so they were just running horror with you know with these huge mammals, and they were like, "Oh my god, this guy!" And they were looking at him as a god. Even to this day, um, a lot of military, um, you know, schools study his tactics. Absolutely. To this day, because what he did was just outside the box. And, you know, and he was successful. And I remember I was in ninth grade and my English, my history teacher brought up, well, who, you know, who do you look up to? Da, da, da. And I said, I look up to Hannibal of Carthage. And she's like, oh, yeah, I've, you know, I know Hannibal. You know, uh, she, he was a white general. She, she said white general. So I'm sitting all the way in the back, like most black students in classes, we sit in the back. Right, we automatically just go in the bag. We just, so I'm like, no, you know, he wasn't. He was. He was African. He was black. No, no, no. So, and I wasn't being disrespectful. I said, I got his poster up on my wall. She's like, no. Nope. So, I ended up getting a detention because I disagree with her. And my whole thing was, I wasn't upset um, about the fact that she was saying Hannibal is white. I was upset about the, the potential ass whooping I was going to get for getting a detention. But you know, my mom was. She she understood, and we were in a different area. We were in New Hampshire at the time, so she said it, it, it's a little bit different <laughs> up here. But Hannibal was my guy, and um, and Mansa Musa was another one that you know I looked to read about how he virtually collapsed economic markets by simply giving gold away. <laughs> you know, it, it was like. When you when you equate his wealth, because right now they say Jeff Be Bezos is the wealthiest person of all time, whatever. But when you juxtapose his wealth with Mensa Musa's wealth, they're saying that his wealth, you know, was north of five hundred trillion in estimates. So it's like, how do you? But no one talks about that. So when we talk to our black kids about iconic black figures, we have to, and this is why I think this is a great topic, many that you raised, is in this country, black history is, is usually starts at slavery and on up. And even with some of the educators, they're trying to like erase slavery and call us migrants and say, oh, we were workers and, and whatever, and start black history from 1965 on up. But black history, <laughs> spans thousands, millions of years. 
when D when Daryl talked about the 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 Horn of Africa, the you know the civilization being started there, Timbuktu, the the the, the world's first libraries. It, it's you know there's so much richness in the history of melanated people. You, you just can't the more you can't rely on the the mainstream dominant society to teach you that or teach us that. It's incumbent upon us to teach our kids that. And there's a sense of pride that goes along with that. And there's been studies when kids know their history, that they're more prone to deal with challenges and issues. And there's a level of pride and dignity associated with that. I love how you brought up. I was waiting for you to get to the, and I told y'all he had more to say than that. He wasn't usually so. <laughs> but um, I love how you mentioned that the teacher tried to tell you that that Hannibal was was white. Um, I too got in trouble in school when it came up to um, social studies class and Christopher Columbus. Like, wait a minute, ma'am. <laughs> How many people here? How are you going to say you discovered it? And, you know, we get in trouble for that. Because at the end of the day, the victors control the story. They control the narrative. You know, history is 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 made, but it's it's not record it's not recorded accurately. It's recorded according to whoever won whatever situation we're talking about. So whatever they couldn't whitewash and, and turn, you know, black accomplishments into white accomplishments, they omit it completely. Like Nancy Musa. Like when you hear about, you know, Jeff Bezos being, you know, the, the richest man in history, that, that is a bold-faced lie. Can you imagine somebody just right now, listen, if somebody came down the street right now, just throwing gold around, just throwing gold like that, that's that's, an, that's a, a very empowering image. Just Not like just gold. paper currency, gold, gold. minimum. Oh, my God, gold. I just, <laughs> I just read an article the other day talking about that. They were talking about... um. The guy you just said, being the wealthiest man in the world, but they compared what his, where he would fit if compared to Mansa Musa. And this is a white this is a white colonist who says that you know by today's standards, Mansa Musa probably would have been the most wealthiest man in history. Period, hands down. And he was like, "Can you imagine the wealth?" He said, "We can wrap our arms around this one, but you can't wrap your arms around what Mansa Musa did, even during that day and time by today's standards." So I just wanted to throw that in there. It's just amazing. Yeah, you know, in one thing, thing, about the welfare case. Jeff Bezos is a welfare case compared to Manson Musa. Absolutely. One of the things you said, many, uh, it's a little off topic, but I wanted to jump on when you talked about Christopher Columbus. My my son's school, one of their first assignments had to do with Christopher Columbus, and I and I actually wrote an email to the school, and I'm like, why are you? At, at this point, it's not anecdotal. Okay, at this point. We know Christopher Columbus did not discover this, this you know, uh, America. We, he was in the Caribbean and he thought he was in India. And, and, and not even getting into the atrocities he committed and the genocide stuff he committed. And I'm like, why are we teaching this person um, in our school, which is, you know, with, with, that has a lot of black kids in the school. It's like why, like, why would we teach that? And then I gave some examples, kind of like what you did. You know, we could talk about, you know, some prominent figures, you know, X, Y, and Z, maybe the Folsom people, the Olmecs that, that were here um, before. I mean, the Folsom people were here thousands of years, Olmecs hundreds of years, you know, but, and I was told it was, it was state approved curriculum. And I'm like, come on. Well, I see Keyshawn Dodds has joined us. Hey, Keyshawn. Yes, yes. Thank you. Sorry, I had, had, had a little bit of business here, but I'm here. And, and F you, Rob Jones. I'm saying it live. Without the best words, I'm making sure that everybody knows I don't like him at all. He's a troublemaker. It's Black History Month. He ain't back. So <laughs> I, I was like, why is Keyshawn here? We doing Midget History Month? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're doing old off the I, I, I resent that <laughs> remark, Rob Jones. <laughs> so what you say? You resemble that remark? Oh, you <laughs> resemble that? <laughs> that too. That too. <laughs> but all right, I'm glad to be on with my, my people here today. So 
Yeah, so, so we was talking about iconic leaders and moments in Black history. I, I brought up um, this is what you called up Queen Nzinga. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about we talked about Hannibal Han Hannibal Barker. We talked about um, Mansa Musa. So when you, when when you think or when you hear iconic moments in Black history and iconic leaders in Black history, what comes to your mind? Well, it comes to me. You know, when I was growing up, it's always going to be the atypical ones that you hear. But as you get older, you start to read and research and you find out more. Um, you know, I'm just looking at, you know, some of the iconic leaders that I, I'm looking at now, people that you see in, in different areas of of um, expertise right now. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm looking at, at some true history right now that my wife shared for me. Um, there was a, a I think there's six black, six or seven black aviators that went to Hampton University in 1997 when she went to college. and they are now flying all flying for United and going back to the college to get new kids, new black and brown kids to be aviators. So you're going to have more African-Americans, all more black people uh, coming out of, of HBCUs um, going to flight school and all through United um, Airways. And it was something that I see that I'm looking back at all these people that have done great things in history from engineering to medicine that never, ever get the credit due because it's it's not their it's not their time to shine they gave it to somebody else um and they're white and they're pushed to the back burner until years later now it's 2021 and now their names are starting to come out rob i'm gonna kill you with that post and that private message so he just threw me off for a minute because he brought the black black out of me real quick so i'm gonna pause for a minute when I get this right, get myself collected. Don't do that, Rob. <laughs> but no, the iconic figures that I see, the iconic figures that I see, um, and and right off the top of my head, I can't just think of names. I'm gonna be, I have to pull them up. But I'm looking at different areas because what it does for me, it makes me look at fields that at that we don't really present to our kids in our public schools. Um, you don't ever really see teachers. For uh, saying, you know what, you can be a great mathematician, you can be an engineer, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be, you know, you can go into aerospace engineering. A lot, a lot of our kids probably don't even know what aerospace engineer is. Um, but once you start to see people that look like you in these fields, that is history in the making. And, and to me, it still upsets me that we're in 2021 and we're hearing the first black. That's what really bothers me. You hear the first black. And so you know, it's important that our, we teach our kids not just the, the the history of what we know, what's in the front of our pages of the Malcolm X, the Mega Evers, the Rosa Parks, but people that really never get the light, the shine that we until we bring it to light. And you see it like, you know, you had the movie Hidden Figures that came out and a bunch of black um, black women were engineers. They're smart enough to do the job, but they weren't given the opportunity because they didn't think they could. And so. It just it makes you want to be your hunger to see what we can what we can do what we accomplish, and it shows that we've been doing it for years, and so that's the thing that 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 I look at. It's, it's just from every uh field of of endeavor that I see. Um, if if you I guarantee if you look at it when you look at cleaning materials, you're gonna find people that were black that made it first, and it's like and you'll never know because they hide it from us. And until you start to do the research and dig, and then it's yours. So that, that's where I'm Yeah. Not only do they hide it from us, but we've invented so many things way back in the day. Black people weren't, they weren't um, able to hold patents. We weren't allowed to have patents. But let's take it back to historical figures. Let's talk about Imhotep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Imhotep. As you talk about engineering, you're looking at the founding fathers of architectural design and engineering and all that designed the um, steps um, of the pyramid, designed the pyramid for um, Pharaoh Dezosier, I think his name is. And then he was a key advisor for four of the three of the succeeding pharaohs at that time. He was a mathematician. He was a scholar. He was an artist. He was a scientist. So when we talk about that, I mean, from a worldview perspective, I mean, take America. America is one of the newest babies on the block. You guys are absolutely right. When we talk about everything that we've done, Europe would still be in the dark ages had it not been for the Africans that made their way up the Mediterranean and introduced them to a sanitation system. 
they would still be eating with their hands had it not been for the Africans who introduced them to, you know, dinnerware and using forks to eat your food. A pic imagine the picture of Henry VIII just groveling over a turkey leg. Imagine those folks and they walk with their little, I forgot what you call those mocks that they would wear and just, they would, you know, defecate where they stood. So as we talk about sanitation, as we talk about makeup, as we talk about paint, the smelling of iron, all that stuff. So I agree for us to use the moniker, the first to do anything that may apply in America, but I think we really have to get over that. And um, as I've been listening for the last 30 minutes, we keep using them and they an awful lot. I think damn be the people who relies on their slave master to teach them anything. And we're still remind, relying on the grand, grandchildren and great grandchildren of, our, of our, our, our ancestors, slave masters, to teach us anything. And we're expecting them to be fair and honest. This shit ain't going to happen. And until we begin to create the institutions, take small rooms the way they did back in the early and late 1800s and early 1900s, just take small rooms and turn them into classrooms. And start teaching classical African history because that's what it is. Classical African history. We talk about the music that we listen to today. We always bring up the impact of hip hop on the world. Bump hip hop. That's like the newest baby on the world. We got so many different types of music that we created out of anything and everything. So it's like, what's a defining moment in African history? Damn. How well, do you, one. you know, it's like, where, where do you begin? <clears throat> talk about you know the most defining moments and i think this is a dope topic because if you polled 500 people and asked about defining moments in classical african history i guarantee you 95 percent of them wouldn't know what to say there's so many dudes back when you look at you know everybody's been watching wonder woman not realizing that the whole image and legend of Wonder Woman came from the queen of the area that is now Nigeria. She was a warrior queen. She they took over villages and cities and just expanded that scope. I forgot what, what the name of the what it was called, what the country was called at that point pre-Nigeria. But there's like Greek legends off of this woman. She was, they, they looked at her as if she was damn near a goddess. And she started, you know, she became a warrior by the age of 14 and 15. She was a warrior princess. And when her father tried to, tried to keep her to the point from being, you know, married off or falling in love, he wanted to keep her in the army. She splinted off and started her whole, started a whole new kingdom. Or I should say queendom. So when you talk about defining moments, it's kind of like we keep relying on white people to educate us on us, assuming assuming that they actually had this information. I've debated with teachers when I was in college, debated with professors. Yo, they're not the brightest. They be great to take information. Is that not much wrong? Yeah, I think it is. All right. So they regurgitate a lot of information, and half the information we need to learn about Africa, they don't know. And I'm going to be quiet. Um, I love how you brought up Emotep. I mean, that, that escaped my mind. Hell, we can end the show with that one because, I mean, Emotep, he was the father of modern day medicine. You know what I'm saying? When you talk about Timbuktu, do you realize that everybody in the world came to Africa to learn? They didn't necessarily accredit their findings to nope. the mother. But when you got, we talk about philosophers like Socrates and Plato and all, who taught them? Who taught them? They went to the mystery schools. We started a system of, we started the system of education on the planet. Um, and I just want to point out that we do not oppress a weak people. Mm -mm. You don't have to try so hard to oppress a real. weak people. Mm -hmm. you, you, there's no need. A weak people will keep themselves oppressed. That might be what we've come to now, but the efforts that they've taken to destroy our contribution to civilization is because they understand their position when it comes to human civilization. There's not anything you do or use that you can attribute to classical African history, like Demar said. You can't flip a light switch, okay? You can't you can't mow your lawn, you can't refrigerate your food, you can't have open heart surgery. You can't use your GPS. If you take away that contribution to civilization, it's completely uncivilized. You're going to go back to the, to the mountains, all fours, and there's 
on your ass without African classical history. Um, which brings me to I can't I can't not talk about Marcus Garvey. I am a Garveyite, okay? I am a pan Africanist. I'm a Garveyite through and through. That man was amazing. Amazing. Came here from Jamaica very, very young, and eventually had four million black people in one place for a conference. And we're talking telegraph days, okay? We're not talking, you know, Wi-Fi, talking telegraph, okay? We're talking about call and tell the operator who you're trying to get in touch with days. Um, and it's hard, and we have all these tools nowadays. We have all this technology. Am I being loud, Rob? Am I loud? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, me loud. I just want to try to know you call me loud. Um, we have all this technology, and to this day, it's hard to get four million followers without dribbling a ball or spitting a whack 16 bars or, um, you know, anything of that nature. It's hard to get that many followers. And this man did it without Wi Fi, he did it without phones. Four million people in one place at the right time for one purpose. That is amazing. That is amazing. And this man was so clean. So clean that the feds couldn't do better. <laughs> couldn't do better than mail fraud. They begged that man for mail fraud. He was so squeaky clean in the way that he moved that they couldn't do better than mail fraud. And that's what they used to support him. Um, and really, it was um, he got this freight liner. That's what really set him off. He got this freight liner, um, and he had a deal with Liberia to give us jobs and land so that we could go back home. A lot of people, a lot of racist people, ignorant racist people will tell you, oh, go back to where you came from. Like, they're going to let us. Anytime you've had um, any type of a, a mass immigration out of the country, those those efforts have been thwarted um, by U.S. politicians and, and, and the government. Um, but I love Marcus Garvey. And he's another leader, which is which is uncommon, that, that died of, of old age. He was, he was in his 80s or something like that, maybe his 70s. But, but he wasn't assassinated wasn't taken out in that sense, but his movement was neutralized. Um, Cause that's, that's what they do. But I love, love, love Marcus Garvey. If you want to see anywhere in black history, start with Marcus Garvey because he understood that we're not the minority. Even if you look at a map, if you look, the map is racist. The map is racist. South America is bigger than Greenland. I think about like nine times bigger than Greenland, but, but on a map, it's, it's small. Africa, most of the continents can fit inside Africa. That's how big Africa is. And Africa is more centralized as far as the globe is so concerned. But they understand that children equate size and position with authority. So they put Africa lower, they put it smaller, they put all of the, um, all of the, uh, the black lands smaller and lower because they understand that children understand position and they equate position with authority. So. I would say question everything, read as much as you can. Read, read, read. The most egregious, the most egregious thing you could do as a slave owner, I don't even wanna say slave, as a human trafficker, is allow those people that you're enslaved to read. Because even when you started reading the Bible, shit one damn up, like what you mean? My father said I should be free. So they don't want you learning that that history because then you can't be so easily manipulated and if you're trying to get to a bag ceos need an average of 60 books a year 60 books a year that's what it takes to, to make that kind of money and achieve that kind of success um so marcus garvey that's 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 my man anybody else want to add anything Any, yeah anything? you know you know it's funny that you talked about the size of the continent Africa is, the real, is also the only continent where people can fully sustain themselves. They don't need to import foods or goods or anything. That continent right there has everything that everybody needs. And also when you talk about travel, you talk about astrology, you know, the Moors were like nautical navigators throughout all the oceans. And when you look at how civilizations in Africa colonized every part of the country. So you like, when you look at East India and those people are darker than me and they're trying to say they don't got no African roots, it's kind of like, really? 
Are you serious? Even in the Philippines, even in South America, I mean, even with like the the Olmecs and stuff like that, where you know, when you look at Aztec, Mayan, Incan, Incan lineage, that all that goes back to Africa. And there even and there was even pyramids uh, in in North America. So it, it's kind of like. There's so much knowledge out there, but we had to, we have to be open to it. Many, you said it so eloquently in, in terms of question everything. I think we're in a culture where people just read headlines and, and, and oh, they said this, but when you read the article, the bottom part of the article really tells you everything, but the first couple paragraphs don't. You gotta question everything. And, and I don't know, I don't know if it was my upbringing or what to make me like question the teacher when she hit me with that Hannibal stuff. Daryl and I, we, we talked, we mentioned this the story a lot and I mentioned it on the air. Daryl was in Meriden, probably uh, 150, 200 miles away. I was in Nashville, New Hampshire. And Daryl's guidance counselor told him to, uh, you know, you, you need to go in the military. 200 miles away, my guidance counselor, and I think it was, his name was Mr. Cody, told me that I needed to go in the military. So when you talk about systemic, a system of oppression, how how you get somebody 200 miles away that's unrelated, that doesn't know anybody, went to a different college, somewhat different upbringing, to 200 miles away on the same page? So when you talk about code and we talk about this, got to get on code because these folks are on code. So, Rob, as you speak on that, you know, it's 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 just the way that our system and the American education system is set up. And that's why, like you said before, the, the why the young scholars are so powerful um, for our youth, because we teach them things that are outside of the classroom, things that are, that are help them understand who they are as a person and also about their background and the strength that they have because it's it's crazy that you know i look at it now and many i can tell you this at 42 years old my birthday is going to be on wednesday be 43 i still do not know where i came from where i came from where is the the root of of Keyshawn dies where where is where was i from i got i got down to my fourth generation grandfather on on the Henry Day plantation. That's as far as I can go in Chesapeake. And we know we were probably my family was probably on one of the first slave ships coming over here, but there's no records of that. We can't find that. And so there's a missing part in me that I'm trying to figure out where I'm from. Um because you can't just say and, I, and that's why I get so offended when you say you're African American. No, the African Africa is a continent. What part of Africa am I from? What tribe were my people taken from? Um, because it's like, there's a missing part of you so you can't pass that on to your future generations to be stronger. Because the knowledge base we know, and you look at everything and Robin, and, and, and it's no lie, and it's, it's actually a testament to all of us that when we are giving issues, given problems, how often do we overcome them? We overcome them without, with minimal help. And it, just recently, we started looking at mental health because it stems back to so much more than just what we're facing today. It goes back generations and generations, and it's instilled into us. And we're trying to get that to make sure that our kids have a better start. There is so much that we try to understand. And the one thing that, that gets me the, the most is the labeling of what Africa looks like. If you see it, no one really, they, they show the labelings of what Africa looks like in co uh, countries in Africa of, of huts, um, people that are poor, people that don't have anything. And until you physically get to go there to see it, and my brother-in-law, he's sitting here now because he just busted up in my house. That's why I had to bust up. But he went to Africa and came back and he went to Nigeria and his mind was blown. He said the food was fresh. The water was fresh. The resources were right there for you. And from what he saw here in America, it was a whole different 
ideal of what Africa was or what Nigeria was. He said, Keyshawn, I need to buy a house there because this is amazing. Our people are succeeding. I mean, if you want to look at Wakanda, they have Wakanda. This is how it is. It's built to be self-sufficient, like you said. But we wouldn't know it because we would think it's something else. So there is so much education that we have to teach our kids and also give them the access to get there. I know I talked to um, Daryl about that before. It was like, you know what? I created a program when I was doing my master's. Um, and, and one of those programs was to take our kids out of this country to a country in Africa so they can see, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, but everything about where what this what this continent has so you can come back fully ready to conquer anything in this country because it's already there in front of you and if you have that bridge to go home and know where you're from there's no stopping us and that's how i feel as soon as i figure out we, once we because that, that, that dna test stuff I, i'm still against it but i, I want to do it but i just need to know where i'm from so i can conquer more than what I know I can do. It feels like I'm just always being held back. And I know a lot of people feel the same way. That's a fact. And the, and the same thing that they do to us here, as far as manipulate our perception of Africa is the same thing that they do to Africans and in, in, in how they perceive us. Um, as far as like, we think they are poor, they live in huts, they are the, the 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 flies around the eyes always used to get me like why are they not blinking i don't understand um and that, and that is the that is the perception that we have and then they think we're all thugs um you know all promiscuous and 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 and, and violent and stupid and, and and things of that nature so the only way that you know we're going to correct that narrative um is is by creating that bridge between us and and, and the continent so that they can, we can see each other. So we are, because we're not that different, I swear. We are the same. Not to say that we're a monolith, but we are the same. We do the same shit everywhere. We might not call it libations when we pour one out for the homies, but that's what it is. And we do that everywhere. When it's nice outside, you can see black people outside cooking out. It's a, it's a show of strength. It's a show of power. We do that shit everywhere so we're not like I always say we're, we're we're all the same especially when the beat drop when the beat drop we are all the same. we got those, those those strong roots um and i just wanted to bring it back to the topic for a second on one last iconic moment and, and that um is with um emperor menelik of, of ethiopia uh, it might have been the second um but he fought off the europeans when when we leverage our resources, even though it might seem like we're at a disadvantage, knowledge is power. Like when Hannibal Lecter um took the high road and 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 and, 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 and fought off the Europeans that way. Um Italy, I mean those, those were superpowers at the time. The Italians, the those superpowers. and he ran through them. like they weren't shit and took took their bitches, took their soldiers, like it was nothing. To the point where they didn't even want to make him a black man in history. The farther you go back in antiquity, the darker the deities are. And if you want to go back even further, the more feminine the deities are. But we're going to say that for our topic about, about, um, <laughs> about feminism, when me and Rob don't go head to head, but that's a later discussion. Uh, so, what, what Emperor Menelik did is the fact that he invented guerrilla warfare. Um, that's when you see crazy people jumping from the trees and hopping on your ass and just disappearing and you don't even know what hit you. Next thing you know, the person next to you is just dead and then you die and then everybody else is dead, but you don't, still don't see nobody because they use their knowledge of the land as leverage to win. Um, and he's dope. And the legend has it that he was the, the love child of Queen Sheba and, and, and King Solomon. That says not a legend, but I don't know how true it is. We might not never know, but it makes sense to me. I find the shit intuitive and pleasing. Um, but that was dope. How how? And I think um, D Moss. I think you were talking about Queen Candace before. Um, she was legendary. <laughs> I, somebody get Rob out the chat. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Rob, in the chat, bugging y'all. Um, problem. He is a problem. That's why I gotta kind of turn it off because he's a problem. 
Really, yeah. he says it's Hannibal Lecter, the mass murderer that eats people. That's what they want you to think. They want you to equate Hannibal Lecter with a cannibal so that you don't make the association, uh, the historic association. The fact they were the cannibals, but they, they used to uh, spread the propaganda that, that we eat people. That, that's them. That's, that's the shit they do. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> about Emperor Man of Leap, and then I'll give it. Can I just jump in with something? I, I just want to just kind of address what Keyshawn has said around um, when you say I take offense when people say African American because you don't know where you're from. I think we know the majority of us know that we come from the west, um, west coast of Africa. We know we came from West Africa. I know back in the late '80s, mid to late '80s, when everybody was walking around with petitions, trying to get petitions to make sure African American was placed on the census as opposed to Negro, colored, nigger, and all that other stuff. Most of us back then will push for African American to make sure that we remember where we came from. It's not about identifying Africa as a city or ethnicity. It was just making sure that our kids understood that we are African, hyphen, meaning in America. Just like you have Italian Americans. You have so many people running around now calling themselves Italians, don't know where the hell their parents came from in Italy. So we, and I know Italy is a country, I get it. But the thing is, I think we have to start from somewhere. And it beats the designation they had set aside for us before that, which was Negro. And before that was colored. So African, African American simply denotes African in America. I think the other pieces, you mentioned something about the DNA. I was skeptical as well until my sister and I did it. And we started connecting with folks um, that we hadn't seen or heard from since we were like four or five years old down in Alabama. So I'm not telling everybody to go jump on it, go do it. But I think it kind of tells you, it, when you look at the DNA breakdown, it pretty much tells you what region you came from. I'm looking at all the um, wealthy folks who were able to go back to Africa and really pin down and find their relatives. I think more people should do it. The other thing is we keep alluding okay. to the fact... Oh, let me before, finish. before you go on to that, the, what, which one did you use? I which, used um, I used 23andMe, and then I did um, Ancestry.com. All right, because that, because that, because that's the thing. Um, before you go on, but that's the thing. It's like you, you don't know if you can trust it unless you know somebody that did it. Yeah, and, so, right. and that, and that's that. I know that's something that I, I, I would want to do, but I just couldn't trust it. Um, but I'm, I'm happy that you said that you used it because that's something that that has always bothered me. And and like you said, I understand that, so we can keep our roots with African American. But you know, as you get older. You, you want to know that that question of what it's just like kids that are adopted that don't know who their parents are. They're always going to be like, who are my parents? Where am I? From? Because it's a missing part of you. So but, but thank you with that. I'm sorry. You can go back. No, nah, it's all good. I mean, and I see in the in, um, chat, many say it's expensive. It is expensive. But with Ancestry, I found a deal for me and my sister. It was two for ninety five. So I took a hundred and paid for both of us. So the thing is, we have it. And like I said, we've been connecting with folks. The other thing. They got up there. I mean, there are other apps, African centered apps, where you can actually pin down, you know, specific locations that you're from over in Africa. It's crazy because it brings me back to Rob. When we were at Southern Connecticut. There was a Nigerian dude by the name of Francis. Um, he used to live downstairs. Me, him and his buddies, um, African cats. They used to look at us and tell us exactly where they thought we were from in Africa. Oh man, you a Nigerian? You are Nigerian? Oh, you got a little this in you. And then when you go back and you do the DNA check, they were right on it: Benin, Nigeria, Ghana. They called it. So you got folks over there who can damn near look at you and tell you where you belong and where your people probably came from, what tribe you're probably associated with, freak with the national countries. Because back in that day, you know, before the Great Divide, you know, some of the areas had different, you know, different um, names anyway. So but I'm telling people, you don't have to do it. I'm <clears> not <throat> recommending or suggesting anybody do it. I'm just saying that I did it and it works. So when I finally get me enough cash to get up and go visit Ghana or Nigeria, I definitely want to kind of look into it and explore it a little bit further. Mm. Oh, yes. we keep saying that we have to teach our kids. I think these are conversations we have to have with each other. I think once the adults begin to internalize this information, know their history backwards, it makes it easier for the kids. I think every generation puts it off on their kids. And we never say, you know, we need to take this to the streets, make sure everybody learns this information. Because everybody should know it. These should be a part of our everyday, da our, our daily milieu. We should be having these conversations. Black health, history, classical history. We should know it. Because we yeah. can't expect our kids to know something that we don't know. D, so just recently you did something that was, you know, I always, when I when I go down my timeline on, on, on Facebook, 
some things really catch my eye the most. You did something really, really dope. Um, you took a historical walk back to Alabama, I believe. Yeah, I did. Um, and that caught my eye to make me scroll back up and look at every post that you were talking about, about how you grew up down there, um, how your family would navigate. And it would bring me back to how my family was in Williamsburg and grow and how the family, they built their houses. They worked on the farms. They, and and my grandfather, and they told me like when they're working in, in the cornfields and he was like, you know why we drink, we have watermelon. And I'm like, yeah, because it's good. It was like, no, that's because of, that's how we took our water breaks. When you're walking and they would plant watermelons in between rows so you would never have to go back to get water so you can continue to go. So there was technology that they would have their straws. They would go keep working, working, pop the watermelon, drink the juices out of the watermelon, eat that and continue to work. So they got more production out of it. Um, there was so much that they do down south that we didn't in, in the barter. The, you know, they would trade food. You know, you, you would have corn and squash and somebody else would come down with their their food and they would trade it. So there was so much that that happened down south that we didn't have with that. You know, we neglect to see right. Up there right. in the history. So the history walk that you had and this, it was just phenomenal to see dirt roads, um, and, you know, outhouses. Uh, and people don't even know what that is. Play, right. you know, yeah. Candles because you didn't have electricity, you know, running water. You had to go here and get the it was it's something yeah. else to see that. We had so little, but it was so much. It was so rich with love and family that your families would, could prosper and be successful without all of the blindness that you have in the north. And it's like, oh my God. So when it, when you so when I saw that walk, I, I just kept reading it like, man, this is something else. Because the furthest deep, the deeper you go into the south, it was like the more that you had to do to survive. But also with not even talking about the the racial issues, but just family wise. Well, which was dope to me and see how strong that family that family bond was yeah it was so i used um africanancestry.com and they're black owned and operated 100 i paid a lot of money i paid like 300 bucks you know what i mean that's the price you have to pay to support your people sometimes like i said we don't have those same distribution channels and the same um generational wealth to you know anybody giving us a million dollars to start shit. so um I paid that money and they'll tell you that like, you can put any name you want. When you submit your um your your specimen, you put any name you want. They're, you're identified as a number. So you don't even have to give them your name. Um, not that it would be hard for somebody to get your DNA if they really wanted it, but if that's a concern, they told me exactly where I'm from. Where you uh, from? Equatorial New Guinea. Um it's a, a place called Booby Island. It's closer to Cameroon off the coast, but but I this is is land that's um claimed by uh equatorial new guinea and it was just dope it was just dope um just to see how they handle things they're matriarchal of course so i'm like yeah that makes a lot of sense of course <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't take no shit, they didn't take no, shit at all. no so when the when the when the europeans came sounds to, familiar <laughs> when the europeans came to enslave them they they took off in the middle of the night and a whole bunch of boats and they went to the island uh where they could defend it um, they, they didn't just come to the island. They, they wasn't just, they might have tried once or twice, but it wasn't a recurring situation. Um, and I love that, um, you know, they beat with each other, you know, with other um, tribes and stuff that people that were already there. I mean, they, they, they went to war against each other ferociously for, for, for a better position on the island, you know, for the most, most desirable plot of land or whatever the case may be. But when them Europeans came, all that beef and shit was put to the side <laughs> they yeah, made it that way. So, um, what, did you love, what did you love to see a movie about that? Yeah, <laughs> I would. I would. They don't. They don't. Um, I'm surprised Matt Turner made it to the theaters. To be honest, a lot of shit's coming out where I'm like, damn, they really HBO really let them do that. Like they're really putting out that knowledge, but they have to. They have to. Even these secret societies have rules. They have to. They have to let their um information yeah, out. But no, absolutely. Even the, even the um the FBI and CIA they they have to you know release documents and shit like that so all that information is coming out um I want to say like I agree that we teach each other but I'm so done with this generation I'm so no offense I'm just so done with it give me the babies you know what I mean because you can you can say something to each other and it, and it, and it won't be received the same but when your child look at you in your face and say do you hate yourself you're 
Who's up? You gonna hear that shit. You gonna hear that. Shit. Well, well, when you find people of like mind that you can vibe with, you can grow and it grows. Because the thing is, I think, again, I, th- I probably got you by about 25, 30 years. And people have been saying that since I was your age. And they're like, yo, we got to start with the kids. Well, it's like 30, it's like 30 years later. You know what we're saying? We got to start with the kids. And those kids are now y'all. And y'all grown. You dig what I'm saying? So I think we have to start making these family conversations, church conversations, mosque conversations part of the movies, the narratives, newspapers, songs that we make, if we don't celebrate us and make us the shit, it's never going to happen because we spend so much time trying to, you know, keep our families afloat that we don't take the time to focus on the kids. We have to make a conscious effort to make that shit a part of who we actually are. And a lot of people just talk. A lot of people will tell you what needs to be done and then they don't want to do it. My dream is to have, um, you know, a chain of Afrocentric uh, daycares and before and after school, so we don't we don't necessarily have to overcome that that inferiority complex because we never develop it. Um, and I'm going to do that shit regardless um, of of how I do it. I, that, that's that's my dream, so that our kids grow up with that that self esteem to to even challenge what they know. Like I remember the first time my daughter told me um, that she thought the earth was flat. Like, look, when I'm looking straight ahead, it looks flat to me. Shit. It looks like you can't argue with her. And I wasn't going to argue with her. Like a lot of people, you should look into that baby girl. I was just so proud that she was able to challenge what she knows and say, nah, this is what I see. You know what I mean? And, and I want to instill that type of confidence and knowledge in, into, into all our children to, to, to combat what, they, what they've been taught and to challenge what they've been taught and to, and to find value in, in what they see with their own eyes, um, their own experiences. So a lot of people talk and they say what needs to be done, but they ain't gonna do that shit. And those type of people really been holding us back. I, I always say, I don't need your two cents. If your two cents don't come with actionable solutions that you also plan on playing a role in, an active role in, you keep that shit to yourself. Yo, care. does that comment, uh, oh, Key, Rob, does that conversation sound familiar? Every single time, you bro. You talk about that forever. Yo, it's like a garden. You gotta weed out the weeds because there are people they come to you with all types of shit. They ain't nothing but empty glasses. You dying of thirst, and this is what you get. I'm gonna keep using that example. So you have to come with some action, some 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 type of plan or something, or you don't come at all. Key, I see you had your hand up about 20 minutes ago. No, it's just I, I just want to roll off on that. Just be, just because what many are saying, and and Rob and, and D, you know what it is. It's like if you present a plan and you are not seeing it through, and you give it to me and expect me to run it. It's not your plan, and you have no say in how it goes. And so it's the same thing. I, and I and I take that from everything that I do. When when I see somebody come to me and say, "Hey, Key, I think this would be a dope program at the Boys and Girls Club Family Center." Um, you know, I want to I want to sit down with you. Okay, so what's the plan? How are you going to implement it? Now, funding, I can find the funding for it, but you ain't going to leave me hanging with an empty pr- plan. So. The same thing happened with the uh, the 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 best thing happened with the um, young scholars program. Like I said, I was voluntold to open my space when I first started the club uh, at, as the executive director. Daryl Moss came in and said, "We're gonna run the young scholars. Rob's gonna come in here and be the 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 the, the cook. You know, we're gonna have people coming over here teaching the class, and this is what's gonna happen. All I had to do was open the door." I didn't have to run anything. I didn't have to do a dang on thing, but open the doors. And so one day I walked in and Daryl watched me. He's like, man, you've been cheesing since you walked in. I said, because my building is packed with our kids and they're learning and they're eating the most nutritional foods because, you know, as much as I hate Rob, the man knows his nutrition. He knows nutrition for our kids. So it was something else to see this happen for our kids. And all people were volunteers coming in giving back so many when you say you're going to do it i've seen it happen with the action and it was never the fact that oh this is the boys and girls club family centers program no this is our program it's the community's program because it's the associations and the club because that's how we took care of it and it wasn't just something that was dropped off in my plate that i was left hanging to do that's the type of action that we try to put forth in every person that comes in our circle and it's okay if you're not ready but we tell you come back when you're ready don't come with me with with empty, like you said, an empty glass of ideas because I'm not gonna fill it for you. 
it's up to you to fill it and it's up to me to make you support it so that's that's what i wanted to add to that dope 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 all right, Miss uh, Minnie. So we're gonna do some last thoughts. We don't went over our time. So we're start with our <laughs> closing remark. You're gonna start with um D Moss. Why you start with me? Because you're at the top of my screen, that's all. <laughs> all right. Um, I think this is a dope topic. Um, kudos to y'all for coming up with this. And I've looked at, I mean, for all the viewers as you watch this during the week, I seen the lineup of topics. For the next couple of weeks, all I got to say is, yo, you might want to make this a family thing. Sit back with your family and tune in on the topics. More importantly than tuning in, be a part of the conversation. That's all I have to say. Go ahead, Mr. Doc. Let us have it. Yeah, so I just want to, my dog keep popping up, man, because he want to say hi. He don't like Rob, so he's scared of me. That's it. That's it. <laughs> He want to make sure I got that Grinch out of my screen. So that's it. That's my protector right here. But uh, no, what I want to say is, you know, Black History Month isn't just in February. It's all year. History, this is our history. And people need to understand that. It's a learning process that we have to continue to teach our kids um, and also our adults what has been impactful for, for us in, in our generations from in learning your family history. Um, that's one of the biggest things that <laughs> Rob can't stand you. It's one of the biggest things that that really helps to keep me going every single day. And as, and as as I keep kind of um create my craft as an author, I try to research as many black authors that I can, women and men that have done some great things in my field, and also how they broke barriers. Because my biggest thing is I want to continue to break barriers and open doors for other people to do the same. So I just want to make sure that people know that black love is always going to be here. We respect ourselves and we are so, so great that we cannot be suppressed. And my last thought, cut Rob off because his mic is done. He can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't let Rob talk his shit before we leave. And it, 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 oh, this is an equal opportunity uh, uh, panel here. So we don't let Rob talk his shit. Go ahead, go ahead Rob. <laughs> Just like the diversity of Africa, where you've got nations with some of the tallest people on the planet, next to nations with some of the shortest people. How did my mic inexplicably get <laughs> muted? <laughs> it's it's, it's okay. Y2K. It's Y2K all over again. But no, um, the kind of piggyback of what everyone said, the topics coming up in the following months are um, meant to educate, meant to draw people in and also inspire because there's a lot of history. There's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of innovation when it comes to people that look like us. Um, and, and we need to stay on track. And we need to stay focused. Bring your kids. Black history, Black people is well beyond slavery or the civil rights movement in the 60s. You know, we have a, a long line, a long lineage of just contributions that help shape this this earth, this world, this country, and we're gonna continue to uh, do our thing. All right, y'all, so next week we're coming back with part two of iconic moments in leaders of black history because in this little bit of time we haven't even scratch the surface of, of our excellence and our contribution to society um, as we know it. And then you don't want to miss the week after that when me and Rob go head to head and we talk about feminism. I and can't wait for that one. Feminism has a role in the living I can't wait. Um, don't, don't let the short life fool you now. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, don't, 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 be, don't be confused, all right? But um, a topic that that um that you're not gonna want to miss, and I think it's it's long overdue. Um, so I'll be looking forward to that. Um, as long as as well as some other things we got coming up. Um, around you know opportunities in the cannabis industry. We got um Black Business Series coming out in May. So make sure you are tuned in, and also keep in mind that we are donating our time. Okay, we are donating our knowledge, and a lot of it was expensive. Okay, I spent hundreds of dollars on books, hundreds of dollars. Um, but we are here on our own accord, 
But don't forget to support us and, and you can donate to the movement, our movement, at um, Control the Narrative on Cash App. You'll see it going across the screen. Um, pay us like y'all do y'all tithes, all right? The past year, <laughs> to talk about information that you can't really apply to day to day life. And here we are dropping a whole bunch of Jews that you need to know. So pay, pay us like you pay your tithes, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, that's all. And I hope to see you <laughs> I see Daryl Moss's face. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure y'all come back to part two of this discussion and we love y'all. Afonso I was the first ruler to modernize black Africa on a grand scale. He encouraged his people to learn Christianity and new skills in masonry, carpentry, and agriculture. Afonso streamlined politics, established modern schools, and later became the first ruler to resist the slave trade. When Sonny Ali Burr came to power, Songhai was a small kingdom in the western Sudan. With a ferocious force, the warrior king won battle after battle, routing marauding nomads, seizing trade routes, and expanding, ever expanding his domain. He captured Timbuktu, bringing into the Songhai Empire a major center of commerce, culture, and Muslim scholarship. His greatness is still legendary among the Songhai people today. Askia the Great was a fair and deeply religious man who at times fought established tradition to rule in the best interest of his people. A devout Muslim, he ruled Songhai strictly according to Islamic law. Askia Muhammad Ture united the entire central region of Western Sudan with a government that is still revered today. A wise and beautiful woman from Nubia so captured the heart of the Pharaoh she changed the course of history. Ty's beauty, intellect, and will so took Pharaoh Amenhotep III. He defied his nation's priest and custom by proclaiming this commoner his great royal spouse. Amenhotep declared that as he had treated her in life, so should she be depicted in death as his equal. And so the colossal sculpture ordered for their temple thus portrays them as a pair of majestic monarchs both proud, both noble, both serene. A flamboyant